Welcome to Biblical Foundations, a podcast of the Center for Biblical Studies at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. I'm your co-host, Jimmy Rowe, along with Dr. Andreas Kostenberger. Join us as we discuss issues in biblical scholarship for the church. We've been talking to Dr. Tom Schreiner about his recent scholarly contributions and current trends in New Testament scholarship. As Dr. Kostenberger mentioned, you've also recently contributed a commentary on Revelation in the ESV Expository Commentary Series. Uh, could you please tell us a bit of, more about that series and what are the distinctives of your commentary in particular? Yes, the ESV Expository Commentary Series is, uh, again, a, a, an introductory commentary, very accessible to uh, lay people, uh, pastors. Pe- you, don't, you don't have to know Greek to uh, use, use and read this uh, uh, commentary. It's, I think the project envisions 12 volumes for the whole Bible. And uh, actually, I just finished writing um, Luke uh, in in that series as well. It hasn't it hasn't been published yet, but I I worked on it the last uh, eight or ten months or so, and uh-huh. uh, that was uh, that was very enjoyable as well. So what I tried to do in my Revelation commentary is to write a clear exposition where I'm not dialoguing with uh, extensively with other positions, simply trying to set out how I how I understand the book of Revelation. And and one of my goals in, uh, in writing this, and Andreas alluded to this earlier, was to, was to emphasize uh, through exegesis the application of, uh, of Revelation to our lives today. Because I think for many, many Christians, Revelation uh, it, it seems like a foreign book. Uh, what does it mean to us today? It seems uh, forbidding, and uh, there's so many difficult passages. And I think we tend to say, well, let's just stay away from this book. Um, there's been so much unwarranted speculation. But what I try to argue in my commentary is, look, the main themes of Revelation, of however, wherever you stand on eschatology, the main themes of in the in the book fit with what we see elsewhere in the new testament god god is sovereign he rules over all of history the the key event in redemptive history is the cross and the resurrection of jesus christ in the midst of persecution believers are called upon to persevere and to hang on and the motivation for such perseverance is there's a new creation coming there's a great reward for those who persevere. And and then there's a threat. Those who don't belong to Jesus Christ uh, will face a final judgment. So those are very central themes in in, in scripture. And, and, and so Revelation, when we rightly understand it, is not really remarkably different from the rest of the New uh-huh. Testament. I, I mean, of course I acknowledge there are some difficult passages in there. But what I wanted to highlight is the main themes accord with what we find in the New Testament elsewhere, and pastors, teachers, Sunday school uh, teachers sh- should feel confident in teaching what the book is mainly about. Well, yes, Tom, I've read portions of your commentary with gr- great interest, especially the introduction and uh, almost the mini biblical theology of Revelation, and also the section on Revelation 20, of course, is I've recently completed, as you mentioned earlier, the handbook on Hebrews through Revelation in the same series, uh, to which you contributed uh, Acts and the Pauline Epistles. And one thing I I found helpful hermeneutically for those of us who struggle to interpret Revelation uh, correctly is that you talk at the outset about four levels of communication in Revelation: uh, the text, the visions, the reference and the symbols. And you also talk about Revelation being a recursive book. I wonder if you could uh, elaborate on these helpful parameters uh, for interpreting Revelation. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I think first I want to say something about it being recursive. Mm -hmm. By by recursive, I think we mean that Revelation uh, recapitulates Mm -hmm. uh, history. So, you know, typically, when we come to a biblical book, we, we think, okay, you have the beginning and the end, and we just have a linear progression throughout the whole book. But what I argue, along with many others, is that what we see in Revelation instead 
is uh, we we often come to the end, and then he begins again. So I, I think a good example of this, at least in my reading, is at the end of chapter six. You're at the end of history, and yet yet of course the book isn't over. Uh-huh. And then and then you have uh, you have the seals, right? The uh, uh-huh. the the trumpets and the bowls. I think in each case. You you be you begin at least with the seals and the trumpets at the at the cross, and then you get to the end of history, and then it, then he starts over again. Uh-huh. So 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 we ought not to expect a necessarily a linear reading as as if we have a story that begins with someone's birth and then their death, and 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 uh-huh. everything is just strictly chronological. Yes. So that 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 is key for an interpreter to be sensitive to the the apocalyptic genre. So, you know, it's Revelation 12 is and that isn't the end of history, but we what an interesting thing. Jesus is born to the woman and then suddenly John zooms to his resurrection and exaltation and ascension mm-hmm. without telling us a thing in uh-huh. 12 4 and 5 about his earthly life and death. So we yeah. have we have to be uh, careful to note that. And in terms of how the the book is uh, written, you know, the text, uh, the the reference, the symbols, and the interpretation of 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 the symbols. So you know, we can we can think of, for example, the the text is what is written, isn't it? Uh-huh. And then and then you have a, a symbol, say chapter thirteen. You 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 have a, a the beast, but uh-huh. but to what does the beast refer? I mean that's a key question, isn't it? Interpreters yeah. uh, disagree, but I think everyone would agree the the beast there the the textual reference to the beast is a symbol of something. Yeah. Nobody takes nobody takes that literally. No one thinks it's a literal beast. Uh-huh. So. So that we we can come to a lot of agreement when we when we recognize clearly this book is symbolic. I would say apocalyptic. Uh-huh. Now now to what does the symbol refer? Now I would argue, and this is an interpretive judgment, isn't it, that it refers to the Roman Empire. Uh-huh. So so the, obviously we have to argue for what we think the the reference to the symbol is that and that's not always easy but at least we can make some headway by saying what does the text say what what actually is the symbol and is is the symbol a literal reality because at least some of us andreas were raised in a tradition which said well we we need to interpret the text as literally as possible yes, but, yes. but what but what in the world does that mean? Right. No, no one, no one really applies that. You, there, there's no way we think the beast is literally a beast. Uh-huh. So, at least we we can reflect hermeneutically on on what we're doing, even if we understandably come to different understandings of what the reference ultimately is. That's right. The Book of Revelation is not a historical narrative. Uh, so you know the hermeneutic that 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 works for interpreting. See the Gospels, for example. Uh, we need to uh, modify that uh, appropriately in keeping with the the apocalyptic genre, like like you mentioned. Now, I'm writing. If I can mention this, Andreas, yes. I'm writing a little theology. It's about fifty thousand words of the Book of Revelation. Yes. As after writing this commentary, and it, Lord willing, if Jimmy and Andreas, if I have enough birthdays, mm-hmm. I'm slated to write the revision of the Baker commentary on Revelation. That's terrific. So I've just, in the initial stages, I think that'll take me four or five years. So I Mm -hmm. I feel like I have a lot more work to do Mm -hmm. on Revelation. I don't think I'm finished with, you know, that was my first offering in terms of the commentary. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a very challenging book. I honestly, Andreas, I really look forward to reading your exposition in the Mm-hmm. In the forthcoming handbook, I'm sure you always do an excellent job. So that'll be 
uh, enjoyable to see. Well, it was, it was my first time to carefully uh, pay attention to the text and, and then the, the, the flow of, of, of argument and so forth. Like you said, that's that's one of those uh, the, the greatest strengths of that handbook series. It forces you to to pay very close attention to the text. And and like I said, I I really enjoyed the uh, the introduction to your uh, ESV expository commentary in Revelation uh, because, like I said, I, I felt like this is a uh, a mini biblical theology of revelations. I'm glad to hear that you're uh, going to have the opportunity to uh, expand on that. Um, no, th- no, thanks. Yeah. Now, one thing, Tom, I've, I've greatly come to preach to you about your work over the years is not only its its practical orientation, but also your uh, careful exegetical uh, spade work. I've I've seen you even occasionally uh, change your view on a given subject because you've done further uh, exegesis on a given passage or topic and have concluded that the weight of evidence uh, lines up maybe a little bit differently than you previously thought. Uh, I I know you already told us uh, about a couple instances in in your uh, work on Romans where uh, that was the case, but can you maybe give us, you know, one or two more examples where you changed your view on a passage or or topic in the process that led to this uh, change of, of position? Yeah. Well, one thing I said to myself uh, as a young scholar, I said to myself, uh, simply because I've written on something, I don't want to be so proud as to say, I, I'm not open to revising what I've written because I don't want to treat what I've written as canon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I recognize, um, you know, I'm, I'm writing from a partial vision uh-huh. of things. I'm doing the best I can. Uh-huh. So I, as I mentioned, I've struggled over the years with Romans 7. And since we were talking about Revelation, another passage I've really struggled with, I think I still struggle with it, is Revelation chapter 20 on the millennium. So I was raised in a, as, a, as a young Christian, really in a dispensational, a premillennial tradition. Then I became historic pre-mill, uh, and probably in the you know, mid-80s. Uh-huh. And I was historic pre mill, but over the years I was teaching Revelation, and then I slowly have, and certainly very tentatively, lean now towards all millennialism. But so I've gone back and forth a bit on that, and honestly, Andreas, I I still feel like I could change my mind back to historic pre mill. Yeah. I it's just uh I I when I come to that text and I see the language of the first resurrection and they came to life I think there's some problems with the all millennial view. I think there are other problems with the premillennial view and I find I find myself you know even as I talk about it I I find myself just perplexed. It 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 surprises me a little bit that some people feel so certain on that issue. Mm. I wish I could. I honestly, <laughs> I wish I could feel that way, mm-hmm. because I don't. I don't think it's particularly helpful to say I don't. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. But but I just have to be honest when I'm writing. I try to be honest with where I am, and 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 I think I what I regularly say to people. I say I don't think the millennium is that important of an issue. Mm. I mean, I have a I have position on it, but to to me, it's not a central matter of the Christian faith. Good people disagree. You know, where I teach at the Southern Baptist Seminary, interestingly, the tradition here is all millennialism, <laughs> which is different from a lot of evangelicalism. Mm-hmm. I would guess that now I'm guessing that most of our professors are historic pre mill, but um, mm-hmm. that's not been the tradition. So at least at Southern, we've never really uh, divided over millennial issues. I think that's true where you are as well, Andreas, at Midwestern. It's true. I remember when I was interviewed there uh, a while back and, and, and went back home and it occurred to me, 
nobody asked me anything about my my view on the end times, and uh, you know, I kind of expected that. But uh, all I was asked is questions about did I believe in evangelism or uh, you know some some broader uh, doctrinal issues. So in some ways, I think that's helpful to think about you know the Great Commission uh, in the ultimate scheme of things uh, probably being more important than you know the exact end time scenarios that 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 we can probably only hold to tentatively in any case. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you, Dr. Schreiner, for uh, talking to us today about uh, some of these complex uh, but fascinating topics, especially interpreting the book of Revelation and even more broadly about uh, your process in doing careful acts of Jesus. Thank you for joining us today at Biblical Foundations. For more information, please visit the Center for Biblical Studies at Midwestern at cbs.mbts.edu. For further resources, please also visit biblicalfoundations.org. Please join us again next time at the Biblical Foundations podcast.